Welcome to video lecture G2. This one is on orthogonal sets and spaces in R to the N. I'll be your captain, Tom Roby. Here's the outline and objectives. We'll define the concept of an orthogonal set of vectors in R to the N and prove that any such set is linearly independent if all the vectors are non-zero. We'll analyze the properties of orthogonal bases for subspaces W of R to the N and in particular, how orthogonality simplifies writing any W and W in terms of the basis. And finally, we'll define the orthogonal complement, W perp, of a subspace W of R to the N and prove the fundamental theorem that the row space of A is the orthogonal complement of the null space of A. This is a symmetric relation, so the null space of A is also the orthogonal complement of the row space of A. And similarly, the orthogonal complement of the column space of A is the null space of A transpose, and vice versa. So all of this will be explained in the upcoming two slides. So here's the definition of an orthogonal set and bases. We'll call a set an orthogonal set if just any time I take two different vectors in the set and dot them with each other, I get zero. In other words, the vectors in the set are pairwise orthogonal. So if I've got k vectors, then I have to do k times k minus 1 over 2, or k choose 2 different checks to make sure that all those dot products are 0 like they're supposed to be. Of course, when I dot, take the dot product of something with itself, I should get something non-zero. Um, now, if in addition, s is a basis for a subspace w, then we'll actually call s an orthogonal basis for w. So I can have orthogonal sets that aren't bases because aren't bases for the whole space that they, they live in, but they're going to be orthogonal bases for their span. So here's a simple example. Let's look at these three vectors in R4. I'm right, not writing them as columns just to save space, but it's the same thing. This is just the round parentheses with commas is the safe space, space saving way of writing these vectors. So what happens when I take the inner product of one vector with another? Well, when I do u1 with u2, I get negative 2 times 1, negative 2, plus 1 times 0, 0, plus 1 times 3 is, well that's 3 plus the negative 2 is 1, and then I add 1 times negative 1, so I get 0 total. Okay? I also have to do u2 and u3, so I get 1 plus 0 plus 0 plus negative 1, that's 0, good. And now I still have to do 1 with 3, right? So I get negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1 plus 0 is still negative 1 plus 1 is 0. So that means that these three vectors are all pairwise orthogonal. Any, any two different ones that I dot with each other, I get zero. And so the way I want to think about that is I know it's hard to think about R4, but it's not hard to think about three vectors that are mutually orthogonal to one another. You can sort of hold, them out, hold out your hand and think about them that way. Okay? So that's what they mean, except that they're, they're not just the, the, the standard basis vectors or anything like that, but they do create a kind of their own standard basis. It's not quite a standard basis because the lengths don't match, but it does have this really nice feature, which is that if I, I have an orthogonal set, then it's always going to be linearly independent. There's no way for me to have a linearly dependent set of vectors that are all pairwise orthogonal, assuming that they're all non-zero. If you've got a zero vector, then you know that it's linearly dependent. You don't have to think about it anymore. So this is the theorem. An orthogonal set of non-zero vectors is linearly independent and therefore, it's a basis for its span, right? Because a basis is just a linearly independent spanning set. And clearly, um, S spans the set that it spans by definition. So let's see how this proof works. Um, so oh, I guess I, I have one line. Let's see. So my cryptic note is apply dot with u sub j to a linear dependence relation for S. So suppose that I had a linear dependence relation for S. So what would that mean? That would mean I have C1 times U1 plus C2 times U2 plus dot 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 plus CK times UK has, is equal to zero, right? And what I want to show is that all of these C sub i's have to be zero if this holds. All right, well now if I decide, all right, I'm just going to dot this whole thing with I don't quite have room for it here, but u sub j. So dot this with u sub j, and that'll be equal to, it's commutative, this, this product, so it doesn't really matter which side. I dot them on, but if I dot this side with uj and that side with uj, I should get the same thing. Okay? Well, dotting anything with 0 just gives me 0. 
And now what happens when I dot uj with this? Well, it, dot product respects linear combination. So I can just say this is equal to c1 times u1 dot uj plus c2 times u2 dot uj plus dot 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 plus ck uk. And now I'll just write all the dot uj's in the different color like I did before. And that has to equal 0. OK, but what are all these things? I know that the only ta way that this is, all of these are 0, right, except for the term which had a uj in it. I mean, I don't know whether j could be 1 or 2, but what it, whichever one it is, just call it j. All these other guys are 0 by definition of orthogonality. So what I'm left with then is just c sub j times u sub j dotted with u sub j, which we know is just the norm of u sub j squared, that's equal to 0. Now since this is a non-zero vector, its length is non-zero, so its length squared is non-zero. So I just have cj times some non-zero thing equals 0, so that implies that c sub j equals 0. And now you just say, OK, the same proof holds for any j. I can do this with u sub 1, u sub 2, and so on. And so step by step, I'll show that all of these c1 through ck have to be 0. So therefore, it's linearly independent because I can't have a, you know, the only way this can be 0 is if all of the c sub i's are 0. OK, so that was simple enough. Um, and it shows you the power of orthogonality, of bringing geometry into the picture. And so here's another theorem, which I call informally orthogonal basis rock, which is that if I have an orthogonal basis for a subspace W, and I want to write Y, suppose Y is in W and I want to write it, as this linear combination, then I claim I have this really simple formula that c sub j is just y dot u sub j divided by u sub j dot u sub j. And why is that? Well, it's really exactly the same reasoning that we just had. So if, so now, so if I write here, so if y equals C1U1 is expressed in terms of this, plus CPUP in terms of this basis, then what happens when I dot this with CJ? So then, sorry, with U sub J. So then if I take U sub J dot Y, that's going to be equal to C1 U sub 1 dot U sub J plus a dot plus cp u sub p dot u sub j. And the only term over here that survives is u sub j dot u sub j. And then you divide by it. Okay? So, so this means that y dot u sub j and, and uh, u sub j dot y are the same. So this will be equal to c sub j times u sub j dot u sub j. And so that implies the formula I want when I just divide each side by u sub j dot u sub j. And remember, u sub j dot u sub j is just the norm of u sub j squared, just like I used up there. Okay? So that's all there is to it. So that's why orthogonal bases rock. Um, so let's see if we can do this in an example right now. So what happens, for example, here? Suppose that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let y, so let's let y be the vector in R4, negative 2, 1, 9, 2. Okay. I want to express it in terms of u1, u2, u3. So all I have to do is figure out what all these coefficients are and put them in front of u1, u2, u3. So u1, u2, u3 are the vectors there. And what are the coefficients going to be? So this is going to be equal to well, I have to take this vector and dot it with u1. So when I do that, I get 4 plus 1 is 5 plus 27 is 32 plus 2 is 34. Did I do that right? And then I have to divide by um, the norm of this vector squared. So the norm of this vector squared is just 4 plus 1 is 5, plus 
um, 9 is 14 plus 1 is 15. And so I think what happens is that I end up getting, this is equal to 30 over 15. So let's just double check that. This, when I dot these two things, I get 4 plus 1 is 5 plus 27. Ah, this is a minus 2. There we go. And then minus 2, so I got 32, and then minus 2 is 30, right? So I get 30 over 15 times that vector u sub 1, minus 2, 1, 3, 1. And if you do the other two, you'll see that you get similar things, right? So for example, if I dot this with u2, I'm going to get negative 2, 0, um, 9 is 7, and then plus 2 is 9. I'm dividing it by the norm of this, which is 3. So 9 divided by 3 is 3. So I get plus 9 thirds times the second vector, 1, 0, 1, minus 1. And then finally, the last one, I'll get um, negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1, 0, minus 2 is negative 3 divided by 3. So I get um, plus negative 3 over 3 times this last vector, 1, 1, 0, 1. Okay? So that was way, so, so, and I guess then if you want, you can work these out, right? This is 2, this is 3, this is negative 1. So those are the coefficients with which I respect. To, if I want to write y with respect to this, then that's what I get. Okay, so what's next? Um, oh, let me just say one more thing here, which is that this expression is really the orthogonal projection of the vector y onto u sub j. Right? And so what that means in rough terms is you probably saw this in calculus before when you like to decompose things. Right? So you've got some vector in calculus and you want to decompose it into its components. Right? It might have a horizontal component that look like this and a vertical component that look like this and the sum of those vectors is supposed to be the vector that you started with. So this is the same kind of situation here where this, you might think of this as being y, and this might be u sub 1, and this might be its projection. And they're not actually u sub, u sub 1 and u sub 2 might be like these vectors, but then you project onto those vectors and you end up getting um, that this would be the projection. These two longer vectors would be the projections onto those things. So we'll make that all more precise in an upcoming video lecture, but I just wanted to do the foreshadowing. Um, and the other thing to point out is that wouldn't it be nice if all of these, if we didn't have denominators, right? Because we don't like fractions. Who does, right? But if we didn't have fractions here, we'd be really happy. And the way to do that would be if uj dot uj was 1. In other words, if uj was a unit vector. So uh, we'll talk in an upcoming video lecture about that situation where we're dividing by 1 where these are unit factors and those are called orthonormal bases. Okay, so now let's look at another place where orthogonality is uh, really useful. So we know what it means for two vectors to be orthogonal, but what does it mean to be orthogonal to an entire subspace of vectors? So that's what this definition is about. So we'll say that a vector is orthogonal to W, where W is a whole subspace, if, well, it's orthogonal to each vector in W. So it doesn't matter which vector of w I pick, z dot w will always be equal to 0. And then we'll define the orthogonal complement of w to be the set of all vectors that do that, that are orthogonal to everything in w. Okay, so what's a simple example? Well, the standard basis in R3 is a really good example just to keep in mind for the basics, right? Because if I want to have a vector that when I dot it with 1, 0, 0, when I dot it with 1, 0, 0, I just get the first component, right? So if that's going to be 0, then the first component of my vector has to be 0. And similarly, if I dot 0, 1, 0, with a vector of length 3, then that means the second component, and get 0, then the second component has to be 0. So that means the only possible things that are left have to be things which are multiples of 0, 0, 1, right? 
And it's clear that if I dot this vector with either of those two vectors, I get 0. And it's also clear that um, any multiple, right, I, it would work the same way. So, um, so that's it. And you might say, well, how in general do you figure these things out? Well, if you want to figure out whether a vector is orthogonal to a subspace, basically you just take a basis for that subspace. And if it's orthogonal to the basis, then by linearity it'll be orthogonal to any linear combination of the basis elements, which means anything in W. So this is another reason why we want to have a good handle on bases. So here's um, an example where I took two vectors in R4. And uh, I'm just telling you right now, I'll explain later how I got this, but that if I want to look at what the perpendicular space is to these two vectors in R4, well, it's the span of these two vectors in R4. In fact, each of these guys is a, the, the, these vectors happen to be linearly independent. So this is a two-dimensional vector space in R4, and this is another two-dimensional vector space in R4. In this example, we had a two-dimensional vector space W, a plane, right? If you want to think about that as being like the x and y axis, and then it's uh, the things that were orthogonal to it were the things along the z axis, right? And the only intersection of those things is just the zero vector. Okay? So just to, to make sure your intuition is right, you want to think about the orthogonal complement of something as being something that only intersects in zero. Um, and it's pretty easy to see that. And I'll explain that in a second, too. But you don't want to think about like having two walls intersecting. Because if two walls were intersecting, um, then that line of intersection, well, that would have to be in both spaces. So it would have to be perpendicular to itself. So in fact, I think that's the, the easy exercise I'm suggesting. That if you have that, so first of all, it's not hard to show that W perp is a subspace, right? Why? Because the condition is that something is in W perp if when I dot it with everything in W, I get zero. But that means that if I, I know if I like added two things, right? X and Z were both dotted with W gave me zero, then X plus Z dotted with W give me zero by the property of the dot product. And also any scalar multiple of Z dotted with W would give me zero. So it's easy to show that W perp is a subspace. And it's also easy to show that W intersect W perp has to be zero because if anything else were in there, then it would have to be perpendicular to itself. But V dot V equals zero only when V is equal to zero. That's the positive definite part of our um, properties, really the axioms of, a, of an inner product. So here's a theorem that Gil Strang, who's the grand old man of linear algebra, still teaching at MIT. His videos are on the web. I recommend them and, has, and his book calls this one of the fundamental theorems for matrix, fundamental theorems of linear algebra, actually. Um, and so what it says is that the orthogonal complement of the row space of a matrix is just the null space. And the orthogonal complement of the column space of a matrix is the null space of a transpose. And so I'm going to take a pause to draw a picture for you that explains a little bit more what's going on. OK, so let me show you this picture, which illustrates what's going on here. So if I have an m by n matrix, then it represents a linear transformation from r to the n to r to the m. Now inside there, I've got a bunch of subspaces, right? And we've talked a lot about three of them and not so much about one of them. The ones we talk about the most are the null space of A, which lives over here, right? It's the set of all vectors that map to 0. So everything in this red null space maps to the zero vector in the target. Okay. Um, the column space, we know that the column space and the row space both have the same dimension, which I'm calling R. Um, that's the rank of the matrix. And so because these are orthogonal complements, we know that the dimension of the null space we know that the dimension of the null space plus the dimension of the column space is equal to n. So that means that if this has, and we know that the dimension of the column space and the row space are the same, that's the rank. So therefore, the null space has dimension n minus r. And saying that these are orthogonal complements is a refinement of that. Because whenever you have two matrices which are orthogonal complements to each other, then that means that um, basically you can write any vector in the space uniquely as a linear combination of one of these things and one of those things. 
So you can, you can get these two vectors by combining these vectors as a, not just a union, but what's called a direct sum. But here's the point, right? So I can, so if I've got some vector x here, what happens to it? Well, I can split it up as a vector in the row space plus a vector in the null space because these things are orthogonal complements. And that means, and so now where does x go? Well, x goes to some vector b, and that's the same vector that if I've split it up into its components, I've got the row space part and the null space part. The null space part goes to 0. So that means the row space part has to also go to b. Okay? So that's the picture that's floating around in all of these things. Um, and so a transpose, you know, that, that's going to be a matrix that goes from R to the M to R to the N. It goes the other way, right, because I've switched rows and columns. So then the row space of a transpose is, the column space of A transpose is the original row, sp row space of A transpose is the column space of A. And so um, all of these things work. You really only need to show one of these theorems to understand both of them. All right, but that was my main point, is to show you, show you this, the picture of this theorem and how all of these things tie together. And what's really nice is that understanding why this is true is quite simple. Okay? Because if you think about the row-column row rule for matrix multiplication, what does that say? Well, it just says that if I take A, If I take my matrix A and I think about it as being a bunch of rows, row 1 vector, row 2 vector, and it's going to have, it's an M by N matrix, so it has M rows. And now I look for something, um, and then I think about what happens when I multiply it by something in the null space. Well, so the null space is taking, so I'm dotting it with X1, x2, dot, 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 xn. Each of these vectors, each of these vectors, r1, r2, these are row vectors. They're all in r to the n. Okay? So now if I dot it with some vector here that's in the null space, and it says I get 0, what does that mean? Well, that just means that taking this vector and dotting with that vector gave me 0. And that means that this row is orthogonal to this column. Dotting this row with this column also gives me 0. So basically all I'm saying when I say that x is in the null space is I'm also saying that x is orthogonal to each row vector. And that's just saying that x is in the orthogonal complement of the row space. So you have this beautiful kind of geometrical picture that comes out once you understand a little bit more about orthogonality and how that plays a role in all of this matrix stuff, at least in Rn. And let me just do one more concrete example so that we can see what's going on. So suppose A is the following matrix, which I just made up using those first two columns and then a third vector. So if I row reduce it, then I get this matrix that has two non-zero rows. So that means this matrix originally had rank two. And this matrix has rank two. So now what's a basis for the row space? So the row space. Um, is going to have a basis of the rows here. So the basis for this will be, maybe I'll write in a contrasting color just so it's easier to see. So basis for this is going to be 1, 0, 1. These are row vectors, so I'm writing them like this. And 0, 1, 2. So that's a basis for that, two-dimensional. What's a basis for the null space? Well, it's not hard to see using the standard algorithm that we always use, that a basis for the null space is um, 1, 2, negative 1. And now I'm sort of torn whether to write it as a row vector or column vector. It's definitely a vector in, in um, R to the N, so maybe I should be writing it as a row instead of as a column. Although we often, I mean, whether it's written as rows or columns doesn't really matter. The point is that they're length three vectors, right, in this case. So, so, so in R3 here, in this particular case, so this is the case n equals 
Right? This is a 4 by 3 matrix, so here I'm going n equals 3 and m equals 4. So I've got a two-dimensional row space and a one-dimensional null space, and together they give me a three-dimensional R to the R, R3. All right, on the other hand, let's think about A transpose. Or you could think about the column space of A. So the row space of A transpose is the same thing as the column space of A. And so we know that a basis for the column space of A is given by the columns that correspond to the pivot columns over here. So I can think of the column space of A either as the vectors negative 2, 1, 3, 1, 1, 0, 1, negative 1 in columns or in rows as negative 2, 1, 3, 1, 1, 0, 1, negative 1. Um, and then finally, the null space of A transpose, well, since I've got two pivot columns and two free variables, that means the dimension of the null space here is going to be 2, right? And that makes sense because if this is two-dimensional, right, so here R equals 2, and that's the dimension of both this space and this space, then this will have 4 minus 2, which is two-dimensional, and you can see using the standard algorithm that the null space of a transpose is the span of, I guess I'll write this down, so the null space of a transpose is the span of the set, I'll write them vertically just to save space, minus 1, minus 5, 1, 0, and 1, 1, 0, 1. Right, as you could easily figure out. So, so that's the big picture here of how all the matrix, matrix subspaces fit together. And it's a beautiful picture when you add in the geometry which you get from the orthogonality. Uh, let's see, is there anything else I wanted to say? Oh yeah, so the intersection of the row space and the null space is just this point zero. Now obviously you can't draw these perfectly um, in the plane, so you just have to imagine that this is the only point at which they intersect. That's how I tried to draw it, but, um, but obviously if you extended these, these things aren't finite, so if you extended them you would get some overlap. That doesn't matter for the abstract picture. And I think that's it. Thank you for your kind attention.